So what emerged in these cultures is this idea that you can have, uh, like in a way, part-time monastics, or you can have, uh, you can be a monastic for a period. So let's begin. And uh, yeah, so this week, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we'll be talking about the laity, and particularly because we talked about what a Buddhist monastic was last week. Uh, I wanted to now talk a bit about what the laity is. And this is a, a traditional distinction in uh, Buddhism, in a way. You have the, uh, you know, you have the, you're probably all familiar with robed monks. I don't know how many of you have been to Thailand or uh, Southeast Asia or whatever, you know, you're probably familiar with the robed monks. And uh, so that's a, yeah, traditional, in a way, distinction between them and uh, people who, in a way, um, well, I'll say a bit about the, the monks in a way, but they're, particularly characterised by people who have what's called gone forth, they've given up uh, their livelihood, their life, and they've, they've decided to become full-time uh, practitioners, if you like, uh, usually with no possessions or very few possessions. And uh, yeah, they in a way practice, or they're well, ideally supposed to practice full-time. And certainly in the Buddha's time, they would have been uh, his immediate disciples who in a way followed him around and uh, were trained by him until uh, you know, they became teachers themselves and they would go off and, and teach other people. Uh, but they're contrasted by these householders, um, what's, what's um, become termed as the laity. So, yeah, if you've got a family or a business or you've got a farm or land or whatever, a lot of people, of course, couldn't or didn't want to give all that up. And so, um, you know, these were the people that uh, were still, in a way, the Buddhist followers. They were still interested in the Dharma and Dharma practice, but uh, for whatever reason, they didn't want to give up or couldn't give up their responsibilities and um, in a way remained the laity or the householders. But there's a very close relationship between the two, which I just want to talk a bit, little bit about. Um, it's so easy to think that in a way there's like the, the monks are the first class practitioners and the laity are the second class practitioners. But I kind of want to highlight that maybe that's not quite as, uh, quite as clear as it uh, seems in a way. Um, so the first thing is that the the, the Buddha, um, the Buddha, you know, he was uh, he was you know he started off as a man a couple of thousand years ago, and uh, when he became enlightened, uh, he spent the next forty years uh, teaching, and he had a really significant impact on his society around him. You know, uh, I, I read at one point that um, over a quarter of the population of the earth was Buddhist, Buddhist practitioners. So, uh, you know, both in his lifetime and beyond that, he had a major impact on human society and his particular society that he was in. But there was, um, even before the Buddha, there was quite a, in Indian culture, there was very much a um, tradition of people, spiritual practitioners in a way, people that were interested in realizing the truth or whatever would, would go forth, would leave behind uh, their kind of household life and wander and undertake various uh, activities in order to uh, well realize something some of them were more successful than others uh, but yeah there was this this culture and quite often um, well it was a respected position in Indian culture at the time and people would provide them with arms with food and uh, you know, in the rainy season, they'd provide them with lodgings and so on, so they could didn't have to travel the muddy roads uh, and so on. So it, it continued on in the in the Buddha's time. Um, uh, yeah, it continued on very much in the Buddha's time, and his uh, community of Sangha was also, in a way, looked after by uh, the householders, the farmers, and so on. Um, and yeah, m you know, it, it was thought that um, I mean, the Buddha had a lot of followers at the time and a lot of uh, what were called bhikkhus, uh, people who've renounced, given, go, gone forth. But um, it's considered that actually the, he, he, well, he probably had quite a few, the, the, the monks were probably in the minority, the bhikkhus were in the minority, and the Buddha probably had quite a, few, quite a lot more kind of householders, quite a lot more, uh, you know, lay followers in a way. So, uh, yeah, and the, there's this relationship between, in a way, the full-timers and the people who, well, it's, I don't even want to call them full-timers, really, but the people that kind of went forth, what, like g g became a wanderer, a homeless wanderer, versus the people that remained a householder. And, um, yeah, there was this quite close relationship, and, um, you know, it might, it might be so, uh, you know, as I said, it could just be the giving of arms, the giving of food, but also these communities, you know, you can imagine these village communities might have 
uh, the monks that would come through at certain times of the year or monks that lived in the local area. And these monks would uh, be, um, would give teachings, would give um, well, blessings, you know, would uh, even uh, provide health care uh, to the communities and, uh, you know, conduct ceremonies like funerals and weddings and all the sort of, in a way, the necessities of uh, Indian village life, you know. Uh, so there was quite a close relationship and some of these... Um, like patrons became quite um well it wasn't just farmers and householders sometimes it was kings and landowners and rich merchants and they would be, uh, some of them would become quite substantial uh, patrons so they would you know um, the stories of um for instance very wealthy merchants donating big tracts of land to the buddha and his followers so they could in a way set up a uh, a, a monastic, a bit of sort of a monastic community in the rainy season, and all live together and meditate together and study. So, you'd have this idea of sort of patronage and uh, sort of um, yeah, looking after. But the Buddha was very clear. The Buddha was very clear that um, anyone could could attain enlightenment, uh, and anyone could practice the Dharma, and that it, uh, in a way, the the monks or the monastics or the bhikkhus didn't have. Uh, a sort of monopoly on on the spiritual goodies, you know, on the spiritual uh, heights and depths. So I'll just read you a little quote. Uh, apparently it's from the Buddha. Uh, Even though a man be richly attired, if he develops tranquility, is quiet, subdued and restrained, leading a holy life and abstaining from injury of all living beings, he is a Brahmin, he is a Shramana, he is a Bhikkhu. So Shramana means like, well, a, a Brahmin is like a, a holy man, a holy practitioner. A Shramana is like a, um, is like someone who labours, a seeker, someone who, who makes effort in a way, makes effort to grow, makes effort to develop. And a bhikkhu is, of course, uh, like what we'd call a monk or one, it literally means one who renounces, one who renounces. So very clearly you get the sense that the Buddha doesn't think of his lay followers as sort of second class practitioners. You know, they're just as capable as uh, the monks, as, uh, uh, as anyone else. But it was, of course, recognised that, you know, if, you, if you're running a farm or you're a merchant or you've got a big family or whatever, that's going to consume quite a bit more of your time. And, you know, in a way, the, con the conditions might not be quite as fortuitous as if you were, uh, I don't know, wandering around in the jungle and meditating uh, a lot more in a way. So it was recognised that even though... Um, the lifestyle um, didn't exclude people from being enlightened. It was still it was still an important factor. So the Buddha would would encourage people to, in a way, become one of his followers to go forth. Uh, yeah, to go forth from from various responsibilities if they could. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess we, when I have a discussion with Aaron Push, I'd be quite interested in exploring what that means for us in the modern day, in a way. But I just want to tell you a little bit about how that Buddhist history then unfolded in a way. That was the position of the Buddha at the time, two and a half thousand years ago. But after his death, uh, a couple of hundred years later, there was a bit of um, a disagreement, a bit of a schism in Buddhism. And as is always the way with things, p things kind of evolve and they, they stagnate a bit. And then there's a kind of re revisioning of it and things kind of in a way uh, bifurcate. And you got, you got this with Buddhism, you got these two sort of movements emerging after the Buddha's death. And particularly they're characterised by their relationship with the, the lay followers. And um, you had this one school which um, is called, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to pronounce this quite well, but it's called the uh, uh, Stiraviravada, I think, Stiraviravada, which literally means the school of elders. And they had this principle that, well, it's the senior monks that really knew Buddhism. You know, they were the ones that practiced it. They were the ones that could teach it. They were the ones that, in a way, um, were the ones really going for it. So, in a way, they were the conservatives of the Buddhist time. You know, they they were they were um, uh, yeah. They, so they were, in a way, the upholders of the Buddhist tradition. And they, although they depended on the laity, uh, you know, they they required the householders to provide them with food and arms. Uh, they didn't give much credence to the idea that these people could become enlightened themselves. And it very much became um, the view, their view that in a way the most beneficial thing the, the laity could do, the householder could do, was to provide for the monks, uh, provide for these full-time uh, 
uh, spiritual practitioners. This was contrasted by the more liberal uh, school, in a way, which, which later became the Mahayana, um, which you may be familiar with. And they particularly um, presented this view that everyone could be enlightened, everyone could uh, evolve their mind, everyone could, be, uh, could ultimately attain enlightenment. Uh, but yeah, you know, one's conditions did matter, but uh, it wasn't the preserve of the monks necessarily. So you even had some instances where um, occasionally monks might have teachers that were from, that were householders, that were very, very developed and experienced householders in a way. Um, and they particularly um, put forward this kind of teaching of what's called the Bodhisattva ideal. Uh, the Bodhisattva ideal, which is basically like the idea that we don't practice or we don't evolve our minds for our own sake. We evolve our minds for the sake of all other other beings, all other people, all other beings, and that you know that in a way we're in service of that ideal of trying to alleviate suffering uh, in the world and trying to alleviate suffering in other people's minds. So you had this in a way different relationship. So the 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 Mahayana school, the more liberal view, uh, still relied on the laity, but they definitely, they definitely kind of upheld the idea that they could be serious practitioners in their own right. And you, you get these stories and um, kind of narratives of, uh, in a way, great, well, the, there's a famous one of um, Vimala Kirti, who's this very wealthy, wealthy merchant who, uh, in the story, it's a bit like a bit like a drama that it plays out. But in the story, he basically uh, takes the mick out of some monks who seem to be quite narrow-minded, and uh, uh, yeah, in, in a way, it's evolved to illustrate this point that you can have these well, richly endowed people, people with uh, you know rich, with rich clothing that can still have spiritual uh, attainment, spiritual qualities. So that's in a way the historical, and I just wanted to bring us up to date a bit with modern times. And uh, yeah, you know, in um, uh, certain countries of the world, particularly Buddhist countries, uh, some of these more conservative uh, Buddhist um, uh, schools are, are quite, uh, have remained, in a way, the de facto uh, communities. So if you've, you know, travelled around the Southeast Asia, no doubt you would have seen the monasteries and, um, yeah, the, the monks, in a way. And, uh, you know, they, a lot of them do still have this uh, relationship with the with the householders whereby they're just providing. But what seems to have emerged um, in order to, the, 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 this, um, this idea of uh, the Mahayana, this idea that all people could be enlightened, gathered quite a lot of weight over the, over the centuries, over the millennia. So uh, what happened is that these more conservative schools uh, had to um, adapt to that, had to adapt to this idea that actually uh, these householders weren't just providers of food and so on. They, they were genuine spiritual practitioners themselves. So what emerged in these cultures is this idea that you can have, uh, like in a way, part-time monastics, or you can have, uh, you can be a monastic for a period. So what's very common in these uh, communities and cultures is that, uh, you know, young men will quite often join, will become a monk for a period of time, like a year or uh, however long. And they've become, in a way, almost educational institutions. Uh, they'll join, you know, they'll join uh, these, because um, of course, monasteries aren't all bad. They, they, they're often great centres of learning, great centres of uh, scholarly um, research, practice, and all sorts. So these, you get these, a lot of these young men in South Asian countries joining uh, these, these monasteries for a number of years, and then going off and, of course, having families and so on. Um, and I should just say that, you know, in the Buddhist time, it was definitely wasn't just uh, the monks weren't just all men. You definitely had a uh, you had a, a tradition of uh, women as well being ordained and a tradition of nuns in a lot of these southeastern countries in modern times uh, that um, women's ordination died out for, for quite a period. So in a way, it's uh, culturally only the men that do that. But there's nothing in Buddhism that says that women uh, can't uh, can't follow that spiritual tradition as well. And yeah, in the West, more and more, uh, that's seen as well. Uh, yeah, so in, outside of these traditional cultures, uh, you get, um, you know, in modern, in sort of Mahayana schools and other schools, and particularly, uh, well, in a way, like the Buddhism that's emerged in the West, uh, is now, of course, in a way, more modern Buddhism. You have much more 
much more of a new, nuanced approach. I mean, in our tradition, uh, you know, the Tree Ratna, uh, Tree Ratna lineage, in a way, if you can call it that, uh, we, we consider ourselves neither monastic nor lay, uh, even though we have an ordination. So uh, we, wouldn't often, uh, we wouldn't often think of ourselves as monastics or, uh, uh, yeah, monks or nuns particularly, um, although we also wouldn't distinguish ourselves as... Um, uh, like householders as well, or having conventional lives either. You know, there's definitely a, uh, uh, if you like, a full-time commitment, particularly amongst the ordained uh, members. Um, I won't say too much about that. I'm going to explore that in much more depth uh, next week, where I'm going to talk about uh, our particular tradition and uh, what's called the six distinctive emphases of our tradition, and, uh, one of them being that we're neither monk nor, nor lay. Uh, but anyway, I'm open to questions about that if, you, if you've got them in a, a, in a bit anyway. But maybe I'll leave it there for the summary and uh, I'll bring in uh, my friend Amra Pushpa and uh, we'll, we'll have a bit of a discussion about that. Yes. So thanks, thanks for your Naga. I mean, I'm, I'm always quite fascinated about the practitioners of the Buddha's time mm. and then what's evolved since then as yeah. Buddhism has reached different countries and cultures and things, um, yeah, I guess human nature like, likes to, maybe can stratify around mm. certain things. But, uh, you know, thinking back to the Buddha's time, he just had a very equal, open approach, as you mm. say, to everybody. Everybody had potential for enlightenment. Mm. And his, he had followers of all walks of life, prostitutes, kings, you know, all, all sorts of uh, people. Mm. And there were lots of householders who gained insight and um, yeah, and broke th broke through to enlightenment mm. as well. You know, there were, in the Buddhist time, supposedly quite a few people did, mm. but it wasn't this strict um, mm. division between mm. monastic and lay. And mm. I think, in a way, the Buddha was reacting against that kind of you know, like mm. where the status was, you know, in terms of the institutions like the Brahmins, etc. Yeah, I mean, I love this idea of, in a way, getting back to the basics, in a way, getting back to what the Buddha said. And yeah. it's, it's so, I really like the idea, you know, you read all the stories and so on about the Buddha's time, and he seemed to be very willing to give his like, highest teachings to anybody, anyone yes. who asked the question, you know, right. whether they were uh, like, like Brahmins from different uh, religious traditions or uh, farmers or like you say kings or whatever and you know some of them would become followers of the buddha like in a way um homeless wanderers in a way and others would just continue with their lives but you didn't get the sense that he held back his teaching yes, you know yes. um and you know maybe it may be it's sort of certainly in them in the in these schools that ossified a bit you know it seemed to be seemed to be that the monks were quite protective over those teachings and yeah. you know they would teach the householders but in a way they wouldn't they wouldn't give them all of the no. dharma teachings That's they would right. hold back the kind of uh, right. you know the the highest level what they considered the highest level for for them for the other for the other monks in a way the other and all, yeah and all sorts of rules evolved you know whereas in, you know some traditions it's it's even you know against the rules to to teach um give certain teachings to to lay followers which is yeah. which is so departed from the buddha's initial message yeah but i i just think a lot of practicalities came about you know like how are they going to um, survive as practitioners without the support of the laity and uh, yeah. but also there are certain cultures they've given an awful lot of status mm. and respect and mm. Mm. you know that's that's very tempting to hold on to as well and ossify mm. around mm. 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 yeah that's right that's right yeah um so, so i've got a bit of a question for you mm. so how is this useful for us now in a way because we look back because we, we've got this like two two and a half thousand years of buddhist kind of history haven't we and yes. like we're very in a way we're very unique in that we're probably the only buddhists that can see the whole span of buddhist history mm -hmm. you know all the historically it all would have been rather fragmented so you know we can see the kind of evolution of these models so you know how's that how, how do you think that's useful for us in a way as modern practitioners um, you know, what do you, or I don't know, what's of interest to you in a way in, in, in that evolution? 
That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 I do think, you know, there's strengths and weaknesses, and, you know, and all, all sorts of things. I think, I think our privileged status is that we can, we can draw, you know, there's so much available about different approaches and traditions, and we can draw of what's of most use mm. to us. I mm. mean, I think, I think the principle of our tradition is that our commitment is primary. Mm and the lifestyle secondary, I find that really, really helpful. Mm. And mm. that seemed very true to the time of the mm. Buddha. Mm. You know, was the householder really practicing mm. in their lives? Um, and it's not to say there aren't some, you know, there's a lot to be said for the monastic tradition in that you are just focusing on practice. Mm. But there's also a lot to be said to be, you know, practicing in the midst of everyday conditions. Mm. It can be very, very, very challenging. Mm. Mm. So, um, yeah, I'm losing track of the question. No, no, it's good, yeah. yeah. I mean, in a way, I just wanted us to go into the area yeah, in a yeah. way. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I guess I feel the same as you. Like, I didn't, like, there's something around the archetype of a kind of monk that appeals to me, you know, like the, the one who goes forth, the one who leaves it all behind and yes. disappears off into the mountains or the jungle in a way. But also I can really recognize that, um, well, I'm not going to say it's selfish, but it's quite, at least, at least initially, it's quite self-oriented, one's own development, one's own growth, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Whereas this idea of practicing in one's life, you know, in a way you're around people all the time and maybe you can't, take yourself off so much but you're more engaged with other people around you and yeah. you know more may, maybe more present in people's lives more willing to immediately help people uh so there's a bit of a i'm not saying either is necessarily superior but mm. you know you've got this blending and i i respond to both of those ideals at different times i think you know yeah. sometimes i want to withdraw and sometimes i want to anyway be out there and you know be engaged with uh well with society and with people yeah mm. I, I remember someone who had stayed stayed in a monastery, and uh, he said that he used to think, yeah, we were much lesser of a practitioner um, because, because we were practicing out in the world. And then he said, actually, it's a lot more difficult to stay committed in mm. the midst of all that. It's easier in, in a lot of ways. You know, so there are pluses and minuses. I, I was raised in the Catholic tradition, mm. and you know, there were nuns and priests. So the priests had all the status, and you know, so, and I, and I think that's probably true of the traditional Buddhist world. I mean, as sadly, there are very few non traditions in the, the traditional Buddhist world, but I think because of that experience, I, you know, as a woman, I, w I was turned off by the monastic mm, mm. experience. I think, you know, there was a lot of disparaging of nuns, mm. etc. Whereas mm. when I read about the ones who existed in the Buddhist time, they are so inspiring, they're so yeah. different from what I knew as a nun. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. You get the sense that actually it was quite active, but there's not much that kind of has come through the, the history in a way, That's you right. know, not a great deal is written about them. Because um, also, I guess, the, you know, the monasteries would have been the ones that preserved the teaching. And so yeah. you get this sense that maybe there was some, well, almost certainly some selection you know, and some bias as to what they decided to preserve Absolutely. and what they didn't, you know. So, yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, that's a whole whole other interesting area. But, uh, yeah, I, I think um, I feel very fortunate to be able to, um, yeah, just, just study and, and try to understand these different approaches and, mm. and just... Um, find what's what's still live and, and potent for us today mm. 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 so I've got another difficult question for you which yeah. we like um so if somebody if somebody's really attracted to that idea of uh in a way being the homeless wanderer you know if that's yeah. an archetype that that appeals to people for whatever reason what would you recommend that they do today because it's a bit hard isn't it now yeah. in modern society to in a way cast off all your possessions put on some robes and go wandering yes. uh what if somebody asked you that question at class what would you say to them I guess I would say if it felt true to, to do it, you know, mm. I, I think it's, a, it's around um, inner conditions, you mm. know, that um, you know, we, we all need different conditions. We all need to know ourselves and what we need to personally develop. Mm. And if someone's inspired by that, I mean, our teacher did exactly that. You mm. know, he left the army in India, gave away everything, his ID and everything. And he went um, wandering through India seeking ordination. Um, of course, he was in a culture that was more um, 
geared to support that lifestyle. Mm. But I've heard of people mm. in the West doing that, you know, just mm. finding just finding a way. And it's very mm. inspiring. To me, it's like if it feels true and um, it really deeply inspires you, mm. you know, I would say mm. go, go for it. Mm. It feels a bit out there, doesn't it? But I, in a way, agree with you. I think it is possible. Yeah. In a way, I think I've it's heard stories yeah. Happening. That's right. I think a lot of the time we're just a bit too afraid to try it. That's right. Yeah. That's right. I think I think if you have the right vision and energy behind it, people respond to it. Yeah. They do. Yeah. And yeah. They can see something. Yeah. And uh, it's it's very inspiring things I have heard. Yeah. In that area. Yeah. I mean, I certainly have discovered that. I mean, just in a way, committing myself to helping to run a Buddhist center, like just the amount of generosity that we yes. experience you know on a day-to-day basis That's people right. giving money or time or or anything you know cushions uh yeah like cakes you know anything just just like there is a, just a sort of generosity yeah. around around people that want to try and create right. spiritual contacts and as you know. one of um our teachers teacher said uh, he said if you work hard in the right way it will spread like fire it will really inspire people so, mm. uh, I think that's the important thing, is what feels alive and true. Mm. Yeah. Great. Well, great. Maybe that's a good point to wrap it up. Yep. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> thank Fisher. you. Yeah. Thanks for your night, yeah, great. great, so I hope you enjoyed that uh, Dharma Night talk. Uh, so if you did enjoy it, if you're enjoying our videos, I just want to ask you or encourage you to think about making a donation to the Brixton Buddhist community. Uh, we're a UK charity that relies completely on your donations to uh, run everything here. And uh, yeah, if you, this was a class, a meditation class, there'd be a donation bowl that you could just put in £10 at the end of the night uh, to help support the activities. But as you're watching this online, uh, well, I just want to th ask you to think about making an online donation. If you've watched uh, four or five videos this month, uh, maybe you might want to think about giving uh, £10. Uh, so there's a link in the description below where you can go to our website and make a donation. And if you don't want to, if you want to keep giving, you don't want to worry about uh, making that donation every month, well, you could just set us up a standing order, a monthly standing order. Uh, that would be really, really helpful. Uh, yeah, I want to suggest something of the region of maybe 10 or 20 pounds a month. Uh, if you're uh, able to do that and that would be really really helpful and help us keep producing videos like this one. Thanks for listening, take care of yourself.